Hey everybody, Preston Bryn here with our Trader User Group a free weekly roundup. This is where the trading week ending, what, June 15th, 2018. Well, we're in this continued tug of war with the markets right now. The Dow finished down uh, just slightly under uh, 100 basis points or 1%. It finished down about 89 basis points, 0.89%. It was up the prior week. The S&P was basically flat. I mean, it was up two basis points, so essentially flat. It was up the prior week. NASDAQ, two weeks in a row. I mean, they were up this week 1.32%. And the VIX, I mean, it's continuing to just show no concern at all about some of the geopolitical risks that are floating around out there. The VIX came in this week to uh, under 12. I think it finished at 11.98, 11.98. I mean, we're seeing trade tensions, um, uh, you know, percolate up. I think as the markets went into close yesterday, we saw um, the U.S., um, look at putting on about 50 billion in tariffs to China. And then obviously, as soon as that came out, China came back and said, oh yeah, <laughs> well, we're gonna do the same thing. So they're looking at slapping on 50 billion as well. And none of this is to take effect until in July. So the markets in VIX basically are just basically saying, well, we figure these guys are gonna work this stuff out and it's not gonna escalate. I mean, that's the only reason why the markets are really not off three or 4% right now is because of that fact. Um, now, uh, we've also, this past week, we saw uh, Trump and uh, that hostess Twinkie Ding Dong eating free Kim Jong Un meat uh, in Singapore. Uh, hopefully some good things will come out of that, but the markets didn't react both up or down to that meeting. Uh, we had the IG report hit uh, political uh, issues here in the U.S. So, you know, politicians doing what they're doing. So they're just fighting with each other, each with their own interpretations. Markets didn't really react to that either. Um, so I read a really great quote here, though, about the government from my my uh, one of my favorite uh, guys, Milton Friedman. He came out and said that or it, one of his famous quotes, rather, is is um, if you put the federal government in charge of the Sahara Desert, then in about five years, it'll run out of sand. <laughs> you got to love Friedman. <laughs> really great. So as I said. Um, as expected, the feds hiked the rates. Uh, what I've got on the screen here is the E-mini S&P 500 futures. This past week, the feds upped the rates by 25 basis points and the ECB met. And they confirmed that their bond buying uh, is going to taper down uh, to, to zero by mid-year next year. But of course, the Bank of Japan came out and said they're going to maintain their stimulus. So we had a lot of central bank action this week. Um, but the U.S. is continuing to maintain tightening of its treasuries, which is moving our yield curve down. Now, for our members this Sunday night, I'm going to go into our yield curve again and show you the treasury uh, uh, yield curve and just where it's sitting and what the ramifications of that for will be for us. It's a really great canary in the coal mine for us. So we're, I'm watching that very closely. Um, <clears throat> I'm also looking at these trade tariffs and, and, you know, which industry sectors that can be hurt the most and which will be most favored with the trade tariffs. We'll go through that this Sunday as well. Um, we also saw the power of index funds this past week when Twitter was uh, granted to the illustrious status of being in the S&P 500 and it immediately moved up 5% as soon as they were admitted in. And that had nothing to do with anything in the company changing um, as much as big passive index funds that are required to, to hold all of these stocks in the S&P 500 based on their weighted average uh, made them go in. They had to now buy Twitter and Twitter was up 5%. OK, so we're seeing the power of index funds. I mean, if you look at the weighting of the uh, S&P. And you add up the FANG stocks or Apple and, and uh, Amazon and Facebook and Microsoft and Google. I mean, those values account for over 15.25% of the total weighting of the S&P 500. That's huge. So these things are running like crazy right now. Um, and... Everything is great when the markets are moving higher, but when the markets start to exit stage door left and everybody's trying to get through a smaller door, then it's going to tend to make for some really ugly downside action. OK, um, we also saw this past week uh, oil move down. I mean, oil is down um, uh, over 11 percent 
11.6% exactly from their highs on May 22nd after OPEC came out and discussed uh, uh, raising production levels. Now they're meeting this Friday, June 22nd, and let's see where that, that one goes. Um, and then we're getting some mixed signals in the market, in the U.S. bond market, because the high yield corporate debt, and you can track it with HYG, which is the um, high yield corporate debt ETF. It's up about 2% for this year. And yet the investment grade debt is down about 1.4% for the past 90 days. You know, so that could be an early warning for possible U.S. equities. Hard to tell right now. I mean, we are getting strong numbers. We're getting stronger GDP print that's expected to come in the end of this month. Over 3%. I think the Atlanta Fed was projecting 4.9%, but they're always optimistic. The New York Fed came in at just a little over 3%, which I would find probably more believable. So we've got a lot of things happening right now. If we look at the chart here of the S&P 500, you can see we're hitting right now at this point in time, uh, we're hitting this key uh, resistance zone right here, which is the key pivot right there. You can see that volume over price. So, um, and it's being pushed down. Now, the thing that concerns me is this was the first time we hit it. That was the second time we're hitting it. And this is the third time we're hitting it. If we keep getting shoved down, markets are looking for a signal to say, why would I want to buy right here? What is going to make me buy more? Now, it could be stronger GDP numbers. It could be continued consumer sentiment coming in at all-time highs, consumer spending coming in strong. We're getting retail sales numbers. Corporate profits are projected to come in very strong for Q2, which, by the way, is going to kick off in another three or four weeks for Q2 earnings. So all of that is necessary to get the markets up to take out these all-time highs right here. Now, I believe that's where the market's going to go. Um, but near term, we've got to get above this level right here. There are geopolitical risk, as I said earlier, out on the horizon, primarily the trade tariffs. Okay, And that is reflected big time in the um, uh, index that we call the Dow. Right? If we come over and we look at the Dow, I'll get the Dow futures up here. You can see how the Dow futures are just barely above the 2018 open price. Um, and we've got two prior pivot highs that we are floating underneath right now. That would be this guy right here and this guy right there. All right. And we just we can't seem to get enough escape velocity to get through that zone and get up into this area. Now, I'm on record as saying the tariffs should they come to being it doesn't even have to be a trade war but once we implement these and then we do more with uh, nafta and then with europe i think the dow is going to go back below 2018 and it's come somewhere down in this area here clearly testing some of these lows down in this area here that will also drag down all the other markets but the markets want to go higher guys i mean if you look at the macd there are no divergences here that does suggest that any move lower is going to be met by buyers the markets are expecting the Trump administration to get this all solved because I think Trump wants more badly. That's the right word, more badly. But Trump wants more to have a stronger market than to push this trade tariff issue. And maybe fundamentally he may be correct and have a point there longer term. I don't think you want to have complete zero tariffs, but you want to have a little bit more of a balance of the trade tariffs, which haven't been changed since after World War II, essentially. But I just don't know if he's going to be ready for that battle leading up to midterm elections. So the markets are making that bet right now. Should that bet prove false, we're going to see the markets just roll over quick time. We will get heads light. We'll, we will get headlights into that. If the Dow goes back below zero, that'll be another signal for us to start uh, pairing our long bets uh, and putting hedges on and, and getting long volatility. I've already started to just gradually get into a little bit long vol. Um, Meaning, I'm, and for our members this Sunday night, I go into more detail on that. Now, if we look at the NASDAQ, which is the one that's just exploding, I mean, look at NASDAQ. We're at near all time highs right here. I mean, we, we had all time highs on Thursday, and then Friday, we couldn't quite get up above it. But there is no, there is no going all the way back to uh, April, there's no divergences. Uh, April, May, and June, over the past 90 days, there are no divergences in this big, massive move up. <clears throat> excuse me, since the middle of April, or actually since uh, the beginning of April, there are no divergences in the MACD. So that tells me that any pullback right now is going to be bought. 
in the uh, technology sector, primarily in NASDAQ. Okay, you can see both the 50 and the 200 EMA pointing to the upside. You've got a nice flare between the 4, the 12, the 50, and the 200 EMA. So that to me suggests that any pullback is going to be bought. And if we look at the Russell, which is just as strong, I think the chart for a while there was is is stronger than um, um, uh, Nasdaq. We're at all-time highs here too. Again. Going all the way back to the beginning of April, there is no divergences on any of the underlying uh, supporting indicators, <clears throat> or momentum indicators. There's no divergences, and we got a flare of the 4, 12, 50, and 200 EMA here as well. So there's no divergences. Now, <clears throat> if we do have trade tariffs kick in, the Russell will be le least affected and the Dow will be most affected. So when you've got an index like the Russell near all-time highs, and you've got the NASDAQ and an index where we're near all-time highs. I mean, just right, just, just points away from all-time highs. And then you've got a Dow, as you can see here, which is just above the 2018 open price. We've got a dichotomy here between these indexes. And yeah, generally in, in earlier bull markets, uh, when bull markets are getting underway, the Russell generally leads the way up and will generally lead the way down. And the Russell and the NASDAQ generally in early bull cycles and mid bull cycles are doing very strong. And the Dow is usually the last one to, to come in because it's, it's more of a global view of stocks, right? But now Dow is underperforming primarily because of tariffs. If they get that trade tariff issue settled, I've, I've said the Dow is going to move up a thousand points. It's going to catch up dramatically with everybody else. If they don't get them settled, then you're going to see the Dow again move below the zero line for the year. And that'll be a sign to start taking profits in, in our other indexes. All right, so let's watch it very closely. Meanwhile, looking globally, look at the Vanguard All World Index. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that we're well below the 2018 open price. A stronger dollar, emerging markets are getting killed. I mean, if you look at this index right here, you can see where we're sitting. I mean, we're in the lower quartile of where we've been all year. I mean, it moved up very strong in bubblicious territory like all indexes. They were kind of following the U.S. market, and then they gave it up heartily. And we're down in the lower part. We can't get elevation. In fact, we're sitting right on the 200 EMA right now. And if we look at Asher, which is a tracking stock for China, look at China, guys. It is hovering near its 2018 um, lows right now. Okay, right down here. And the open price is here. So, you know, the question of what's going to pull who where or global markets going to pull the U.S. down or will the U.S. pull global markets up? This is going to be something I'm going to be following very closely, and we got to watch because we could get a scenario where maybe not like we saw in January, but we could see a scenario where all of a sudden volatility just comes out of nowhere and spikes. And let's speaking of volatility, let's look at the VIX. I mean, it closed the 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 week uh, at 11.98. That's just just about as low as we've been all year long, guys. Um, and when we get down this low, after having a kickoff to this year that we've had, volatility is very susceptible to a big move higher. We got too much geopolitical risk out there. Right now, the markets are pricing in that uh, the Trump administration and other countries will figure out NAFTA and these trade issues, and they're going to get them worked out. And a lot of this is just trade negotiation being done on headline news rather than behind the scenes because we're not used to seeing this in on headline news they usually do these kind of talks um, on closed door sessions but it's all playing out in, in, in the headline news numbers so I think the markets initially got tired of all the trade tariff on off again stuff earlier this year and now they're just saying okay we're going to wait until we get a definitive but we got to be careful here there is tail risk to the downside meaning the ball can really just scream Bat shit crazy to the upside. You can see my colored zones here with volatility. Generally, when I'm down in the green, I want to be looking more long volatility. I want to be looking more long trades. Um, and with credit spreads, you want to be very careful and either very small in position sizing um, <clears throat> or, you know, doing um, um, uh, bear call spreads, right, where you're above the market, you know, and forcing the market to take you out to the upside. Because if we have a vol event, it's going to come, it's, it's, it's going to come over the next, uh, probably the next three or four weeks. Okay, that's kind of how I'm looking at it. Now, if we can get through the summer months and it's just kind of glide through, that's fine. 
um, and, and I'll be all happier for it, but we got to be hedged for it just in case. Okay. And one other thing I wanted to show you guys, take a look at the Dow Jones transports. I mean, if you look at the Dow Jones transports, um, we actually cleared this hurdle here and we came right back down and we're testing it, which is kind of to be expected, right? If I were to draw that line, <clears throat> this is where we were for over, a, um, almost three weeks, really. Right. We, we kind of had that big move up almost like a bull flag. We, we, I thought we were going to break out of this next little volume area right here, uh, but we quickly were shoved back down into this area here, and we're doing a retest of this um, support area right here, which is sitting right on the 2018 open price. So again, another canary in the coal mine. We want to watch transports, and we want to watch the Dow, right? I mean, if we look at the transports and we look at the Dow, these guys, if they both kind of come back below the 2018 open price, then I can pretty much assure you with higher probability or higher confidence, nothing's assured in the markets, of course, but I can pretty much um, be willing to make the bet that the rest of the markets are going to come down. All right. And what's going to drive this down if these trade tariffs become a real deal um, and so forth. But right now, all indicators seem to indicate that any any brush back here and the markets want to go higher so these are where i'm really spending a lot of time on right now and you should too because you need to understand just how this thing's playing itself out now from a macro view if we look at treasuries here uh treasury bonds you know bonds are going to do what people don't believe or don't expect the bond market right now i believe wants to go a little bit higher all right I believe it wants to move higher, which means rates want to move lower. And you would be scratching your heads and going, well, why the hell is that? Because the feds are raising their rates. But what happens is when the feds are raising their rates, keep in mind that the the when you hear the term yield curve, right, you've got uh, different duration bonds, right? And you've got, you know, a let's say a two year, uh, a five year, a 10 year, a 30 year. And then on and on and on and on and on, depending on which country you're looking at, right? And what's happening is the 30-year is coming down while the two-year is moving up. The two-year, and even shorter term than that, once you go below, um, once you go uh, into less than a year, you get into uh, bills, T-bills instead of notes. And notes are generally from the 10-year down. Um, and then above 10-year, you get into the bond market. But what happens is this side comes down, this side goes up. And you get a flattening of the yield curve. Um, and there are ways to trade the two-year against the five-year, the two-year against the 10-year, the 10-year against the 30-year. Uh, and you can just trade anywhere on this curve. But what, as I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we've got some instances here where we get a little bit of a mixed bag, right? At least I'm getting uh, some mixed signals here, which doesn't surprise me because the markets right now are a little bit confused. Bond markets are moving higher. Interest rates are moving lower on the longer end of the yield curve because they're just not afraid of inflation right now. And we got money coming in from Japan and Europe because the interest rates there are extremely low. In our Sunday night session, I always go through the yield curve and the spread between U.S. treasuries and uh, German treasuries um, uh, and the U.K. treasuries, right, uh, or bonds. And th they're just going higher and higher. And what does that do? It forces money from those markets into the U.S. markets, okay? Uh, and when they come over here, what do they got to do? They got to buy dollar. And when they buy dollar, dollar goes a little bit higher, okay? So we're seeing this play out right here. I've I'm also on record as saying the minute Super Mario Draghi announces that they're going to start raising rates, because remember, he came out this week and said, well, we're not going to raise rates now. We're going to let it go. We're going to slowly stop our stimulus. So he was kind of viewed as a dovish stance, whereas Power Ranger Powell, our Fed chair this, this past Wednesday, came out. He was a little bit more hawkish because he did say we're going to do two more rate hikes this year rather than one. So that would give us four for 2018. Right. So but. Uh, 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 Super Mario Draghi for the ECB was more dovish. So that means, you know, that puts some downward pressure on the euro and upward pressure on the dollar. Because remember, it's not the dollar, it's more the dollar index. But the euro accounts for over 57, 58% of the value of the dollar index. So that's just going to push the bonds up a little bit higher. And if we look at the interest rates, right, if we look at the 10 year interest rate, uh, what set everything in motion. Um, 
in uh, January was this huge move in interest rates. You can see um, as we went through January, uh, it wasn't so much that we went up to 3%. It was the speed with which we moved that scared the hell out of everybody. And this movement right there is when the markets finally gave up and crashed, right? We had that huge vol of it. Um, and then you can see um, uh, interest rates came down in that little bit of a uh, 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 pattern there. And then it broke to the upside. And then we made new all-time highs, uh, not all-time highs rather, but highs for the interest rates for 2018. Gave us a divergence, and that was a bearish sign right here for interest rates or a bullish sign for bonds. And then away we went. We're at my support area right now for interest rates, which was at 2.75. We were sandwiched between that rate, uh, 2.75, and roughly around the 3% level. Okay. Now, I think interest rates probably want to go a little bit lower, maybe even test this area again before they consolidate and start moving higher. Remember, this is the 10-year, okay? So it's been a little bit tricky for folks trying to play this thing because <clears throat> most people just use the logic and the appeal of well, when the feds are hiking the rates, all the rates go up, but that's not necessarily true. Generally on the front end of the yield curve, meaning the, the shorter end of the stick, you know, less than a year, year, two years, three years, even some to some extent the five year, they're moving up at a faster rate than the 10 year and the 30 year. So that's kind of what I'm looking at. And if we look at the high yield, right, this is kind of viewed as the junk, um, the junk, uh, corporate junk. You can see here how it's just been moving down, right? So this is the high yield corporate bonds and, and high yield, interpret that to mean junk bonds. Um, for, for corporates, um, and you can see how it's been moving down a little bit. So, although it has been moving up lately, but the trend is down, guys, the trend is down. And if we look at the highly liquid, these would be the investment grade bonds. It's, it's also moved down as well. So we're getting this, this really interesting play. And if I were to plot the ratio of, of high yield uh, versus junk, I'm, uh, or junk versus uh, investment grade, you would see since um, May 30th, um, junk has been outperforming investment grade. And that was kind of part of what I said earlier when I kicked off this uh, weekly roundup, when I said that um, even though the rates are going up, they're going up on the front end of the yield curve and money is, is really right now staying away from some of the investment grade. They're looking for more yield and they're jumping back into the junk. So, um, but this to me is setting up for a massive uh, pullback back down to this level here again. All right. You can see the divergence is setting up in this ratio chart here. So I would be more inclined to favor investment grade over junk uh, right now. And that would be interpreted um, <clears throat> as a little bit of a flight to uh, safety in the, in the, in the markets. All right. So that's just a little bit about the treasury market. Now, if we look at currencies, um, I talked about the strong dollar, and look at that. You know, obviously the dollar uh, just had a huge move on on Thursday. Okay, now that move came about not because of the Fed. I, I was on. Uh, I told all our members last week, you're going to get a bigger move on the dollar with the with the central banks in in or, or Super Mario Draghi um, on Thursday than you will get on the Fed on Wednesday. OK, everybody knew what the feds were going to do. He was going to come in with 25 basis point rate hike. Some thought he was going to do one more rate hike this year. He seemed to indicate two more rate hikes, but essentially a, the bulk of that was priced in. But, you know, if I come into a two hour chart here and take a look at this thing. Uh, let's see if it comes up on the screen here. Look at this, guys. This was um, on um, going into the uh, the move here. Uh, on uh, <clears throat> the central banks. And, you know, this is a pattern, by the way, that suggests we're going to have a little bit more downside action, right? I mean, if that's not a bull flag, I don't know what is. And, the, and the, generally the direction of a breakout of a bull flag is to the upside. So if that level holds, that just is all the more reason that the dollar is going to get a little bit stronger coming into this next week. Now we got again, geopolitical risk and a whole host of things taken over. Um, but that would be the way I would look at the US dollar, right? I mean, it's it's really controlled by other factors. Um, and 
I mean, it's just, it's, <laughs> I mean, I don't know what to say. It's, it's just, uh, it's just flying. I mean, it's really flying higher. So that's a little bit about the U.S. dollar, right? And then, of course, if we look at the euro, um, <clears throat> the euro is, you know, on Super Mario Draghi, it's coming down and it's testing this low here. In fact, I said the next stop for the euro is around 114.376, right, to the U.S. dollar. All right, so that was a little bit about where I think uh, the markets are going to be playing uh, near term. Once it hits this, that'll give us an Elliott Wave 5 down possibly. Not really sure just yet, but that was the play. Uh, and, and, of course, if we look at the British pound, um, I'm more bearish the British pound than bullish. Um, you can see here we've been bullish after the Brexit vote. I thought that was a good play. We were just basically buying in the middle and the bottom of the channel and then being more willing to short at the top of the channel of this big move higher. And then once we got up in these levels here and then had these divergences up here, that was a clear short uh, trade. I thought it would catch around the 200 EMA, but it didn't. It broke. So that would indicate to me that there's more signs of bearishness to come. Uh, in the British pound. All right, so that's a little bit about that. And then, of course, the yen, uh, it tends to move up on global fear, down on no global fear. And you can see, just looking at this chart right here, um, that <clears throat> it seems like the markets globally, I mean, we're just, we're getting some conflicting signals. But again, we had all the central banks announcing and, and, and Japan announced uh, that they're going to continue their stimulus. So that would put some more downward pressure on the yen right now, which is good for the Nikkei because when the yen moves down, the Nikkei index moves higher. Now, if we look at the metal market, gold, look at gold, guys. Um, I, I happen to believe that gold just wants to go lower. I had projected an interim price of 12.73 and then a final support price of around 12.50 area, maybe down to this. Um, natural uh, pivot point level that's a big pivot point at 1238 all right we could not when we broke this 13 1305 zone right in here when that level broke then and we stayed at it for almost a month right here when we could not get higher and we made one attempt over the 50 ema but it was handedly shot down uh, and we got by the way the 50 ema um uh, is going to cross the 200 EMA here pretty quickly. When that cross happens, again, that's just going to be more downside for gold. Silver, we did have a breakout in silver. Let me look at these silver futures. Uh, we had a breakout to the upside in silver, but look at that massive, ugly move. Um, I got long silver right here, then I hedged it when it got up to this level up here with um, uh, puts. So thank God I hedged it with puts because I just it just didn't, when we got turned away at this 1727 area, now I'm hedged uh, back down into this area. So I may just hold it for a bit or I could just shut it down and just take the profits in the put, which are greater than my, I still have profits in my longs, but I just wanted to hedge them for upside move here. Um, but look at that mass. We haven't seen a candle like that in silver in a long time. That is a what we call a beat down. All right. So now next week's going to be key. If we can hold this level, and then dearly when you see a candle move like this, um, I would put it, um, I would look at this and then just stretch it out. And then I would put a FIB note on here and then look at a 50% retracement level, which would put us right up just south of the 17 level, you know, right around 1686, something like that, 50% of the move up. And if we got up there and started to roll over, then I would be more short of silver than a long of silver. I have always said, uh, over the past year or so, um, I think in the next two years, which would have been three years a year ago, but I think over the next two years, we're going to see silver and gold make a great run to the upside. But right now, in a rising interest rate market with zero inflation or very low inflation and a flattening yield curve, I don't see it. Um, I just I, I don't see it happening. Um, and it could be just some over eager people trying to break out of this um uh, uh, symmetrical triangle if we if we just go back and let me just put it on a weekly so you can just see this pattern here i mean it's just it's talk about winding up there's the pattern right there guys uh, and we're trying to break out and we just don't have the strength to break out just yet um, so we could actually go to the inverted side over here which means 
in my mind that <clears throat> it's more of a bearish thing than a bullish thing, right? And you can see the MACD doing the same thing. I mean, even the MACD, it's like a wind up. It's like we're going to have a big move. So you got this movement here in the MACD and it's kind of moving to a point like that. And we're going to get a big move one way or the other. It is going to finalize much like that movement right there. Okay, and it may come down and just flush everybody out down at that level down here and then start a slow build again. Okay, now I've got my put, so I'm 100% hedged in that kind of move. In fact, if it goes even lower than that, I'll start making even more money. But I, right now, um, I've got a question mark on silver as far as um, short-term direction. Macro view over the next couple of years, I think is going to be long um, or longer than where we are right now. All right. So <clears throat> that's a little bit about where I'm kind of I, I, I'm seeing with silver right now. Short term, it's just kind of a day trading vehicle. So that would be silver in that. Now, another um, interesting way to play the global markets is copper. Uh, if we look at copper and let me put it down on a daily chart again, just so that you guys can see copper is kind of called Dr. Copper, meaning when global markets, manufacturing, builders are building, uh, uh, manufacturers are manufacturing, goods are being transported, consumers are buying, globally everything looks good, copper generally runs up higher, runs hotter. Now we're off of our highs for the year, okay? So it's not that copper is underperforming right now. You can see this upward uh, vector in the 200 EMA, uh, and it looks like it may, uh, kind of come in conflict with the 50 EMA because uh, we've had a huge drawdown since uh, copper led the – remember, copper started drawing down at the beginning of January. It was kind of a heads up because it was about a three or four week – four week heads up into the January fall of the equity market. So remember, copper generally leads the equity market. So if we get another <coughs> dramatic move down lower <coughs> like this down to these levels, right in that area there, then I would be more inclined to believe that's going to also, <coughs> excuse me, move the rest of the markets lower as well. So we got to pay attention to that. Let's look at energy for a second. Well, I told you OPEC has <coughs> just got a stranglehold on oil. We've moved uh, from these highs of 72.83 down to the closing price of about 64.38, we moved about 11.6%. It's a huge move, right? Um, and it's just, it, it's amazing. Um, and we're now into a wider support zone here. I think oil is going to stabilize here. Um, and then I think the odds, if they do increase production and we see more production coming out in the U.S., I think oil could even drift lower. I'm calling a bottom in oil probably around the 200 EMA, around 61, 50, 62, I think, near term going into the OPEC meeting. It's not going to sell off too much more, but that one candle, um, this is a daily chart, guys. This one candle here took out one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine uh, candle up moves, right? Over two weeks. That one week took out almost two weeks of movement higher, just kind of riding this trend line. And then bam, we came down. And as you can see, we're now into our next support area right here. So OPEC is going to really do a number uh, on this right now. And you can see uh, that we've got some support points right in this area here. But I, I'll tell you, uh, in my mind, um, I think the near-term direction, we may have a little bit of stability Monday and Tuesday, but then I think it's more susceptible to coming back lower, possibly down to the 63 area, um, and, and then finding some support in this zone here. If this zone breaks, we're going to come well down to the 61 area. Um, I think near-term, um, maybe a little bit of a settling in, and then OPEC's going to determine the direction coming out of the meeting on the 22nd. Okay, so that's that is the oil markets. I'm not going to look at gasoline um, and uh, nat gas right at this point in time. And then, of course, we've got the ag markets, which we played um, about a month or so ago. You can see this big, huge fall here. Some of it related to trade tariffs in China. Uh, just a huge move lower. Um, and we're getting some crop reports that suggest a big harvest, so an abundance of supply. Throw in some trade tariff issues on some ag 
uh, then it just it just makes for a down downward action here. Okay, so I would be more inclined to play uh, um, uh, corn to the downside than I would to the upside. So you can see the 2018 open price, 2018 low. 2017, 2016 lows. So I think these will serve as support levels for us in corn, but I think it could go a little bit lower. All right, everybody, that's my update. Um, if you're not in our group, I highly encourage you to come in. Our weekly market watch will be for our members this Sunday evening. We got some really cool things coming up. Uh, and if you're not on our option masters, that's another really interesting, very well laid out, very extensive master's program not only in trading options but understanding how to put together a trading plan understanding about risk management and position sizing um, understanding uh, trade management around various uh, the, say the top 10 option strategies so if, if you're interested in really taking your um, option education and your trading education to a whole new level i i highly encourage you to check that out as well all right, everybody, have a great weekend. I'm off to enjoy some um, outdoors activities down here in Southern Florida. Uh, and members, I will see you uh, Sunday evening for our weekly market watch. Take care, folks. Ciao.